Anyone who isn't dead or from another plane of existence would do well to cover their ears right about now. Were you the guy that actually was re behind, responsible for all the brouhaha, the religious brouhaha surrounding the movie? There was a rumor that you were the guy on the net and in uh, and, 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 and some public appearances, although in disguise, incognito, uh, drumming up a lot of the controversy. Is it, uh, let's, should we answer that now? Was that you? No, that was my mother. You know, a lot of it has to do with people want to find something to um, be opposed to, and whatever thing shines brightest at a certain moment in their sort of like sphere of vision uh, is the thing they kind of latch onto. It's a fucking movie. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I shouldn't even have to be here. You know, explaining to the viewers out there why it's not a bad movie. I don't see why people are all offended, except because of their dogma. Dogma says. Mary, always a virgin. I don't buy it. Early on, I wasn't worried about making the movie because I, I thought that r weird, crazy religious people were in other countries. The notion that, that anyone um, would go after this movie um, as a Catholic or a Christian always struck me as funny because I really just wanted to be like, look, are you a Catholic? Are you a Christian? Then turn the other fucking cheek and shut the fuck up. You know, because even if you feel the movie attacks your beliefs, listen to the words of God and turn the other cheek. I, I think the when I first started writing um, Dogma, it was back in '94. It was we were traveling the festival circuit with clerks, um, and I think we had a few months off. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd thought about writing it long before I'd even written Clerks. It was kind of one of the first things I wanted to do. Back then it was called God. Um, and when we had time down from the festival touring, I actually started writing stuff. And I think I, I was finished, I had a finished draft back in 94, around October, September, October, because it was for, it was around Toronto, around the Toronto Film Festival in 94. It was October. October, because uh, we handed it into. And initially, when we handed it in, the execs were like, oh, "You, you want to trim this down? It's too long. It's too long." So I think at that point it was probably over 200 pages. Uh, and they said, "He'll never read it. He'll never read something this long." I said, "No, no. I mean, let's uh, let's let it ride. Let's hand it in, and and maybe he'll. I, I want him to read this one rather than redraft and have him read something shorter." So he had, he had read it by, I guess by Toronto, mm -hmm. and um, had, had said like, uh, wow, love it. We're gonna get in a lot of trouble, but I love it. It was its own absolute fresh, unique thing, and it took a lot of risks in terms of the amount of dialogue it gave actors and the, the uh, uh, way in which it was largely like a verbal piece coupled with what he wanted to do, these kind of like Sam Raimi, Night of the Living Dead sort of effects stuff and the supernatural elements. And I thought it, it mixed tones really well. Well, I just thought it was very funny. And I thought that, uh, you know, it's, it's very, it's got Kevin's sensibility and, uh, and um, I enjoy Kevin's movies. I enjoy his sense of humor. To read the screenplay and to see how how well crafted it is is um, it's a joy to somebody like me who really appreciates good writing and, and actually at the end of the day that's what makes you ever say yes read like wow this is really good this is really uh, interesting this is a really important part who whoever gets it <laughs> This role of Rufus, hmm, I should be saying these things. These things should be coming out of my mouth at this particular time in my life. It was a really hard script for me because I didn't understand a lot of it. So it took me a long time to read it, and then I had to read it again and, and again. And, and then finally when I got to um, Pittsburgh, I had a list of questions for Kevin. What does this mean? What does that mean? Well, how does this relate to this and, you know I asked him all the questions I had he definitely has a very personal style I mean when you see a Kevin Smith movie you know it's a Kevin Smith movie well, I thought it was awesome the first time I read it we were um we were going to we were on a plane going somewhere I'm not even sure where we were going at the time but it was funny because you know someone was sitting next to me and I was sitting there and I'm like laughing out loud and like the guy kept looking over at me and then finally he was like you know, what are you reading? What is that? And I was like, it's a script my friend wrote. And he's like, it's funny, huh? I was like, yeah. 
But, I mean, I just thought it was great. I just think it's really funny and uh, just some, I don't know, just cool stuff. I, mean, I first heard about the project. I was at the cathedral in Pittsburgh, and Pittsburgh Films Office contacted me. And they said, uh, we have a film company that's interested in looking at your property. Would you consider it? And I said, well, come over and uh, we'll talk about it. Um, Kevin was there and a few other uh, crew members were there. And they handed me the script. And I guess that's where it really got interesting. Um, I don't know what they expected. Um, I think uh, they were concerned that I might not like the script and that I might respond to it negatively. But my attitude is, um, first of all, uh, no one in this world should take themselves that seriously. And secondly, one of the best satirists I know happened to be an ordained minister by the name of Jonathan Swift. And since Kevin does satire, I didn't have a problem with it. The point of the script was talking about how the Bible itself was a book that wasn't really made by God, but made by a bunch of people. A um, bunch of guys who probably got a lot of stuff wrong. You talk to your historians, they'll tell you that, you know, there, there's a, a group called the, the, the Jesus Conference that they hold every five years, I believe it is. They get a bunch of scholars, they get a bunch of priests and rabbis, anyone who has any inkling about faith or religion or religious history, and they all vote on how much of the, how much of the Gospels can really be attributed to Christ, um, and what, he, what he's said to have said. And I think uh, the last time they had a Jesus conference, I think it was like 25% of what Christ is said to have said in the Bible is accurate. Everything else is kind of questionable, probably came from the writers. Um, and that was one of the points that we bring up in the script, not that exact point, but just kind of like, hey, it's a book. You know, it's not the word of God, it's, it's the word of men. It was edited by men. There's a lot of stuff missing. There was a whole section in, in Dogma where we talked about the, the Gnostic Gospels, which you could probably see in the cut stuff, um, which are Gospels that were completely left out of the Bible, but just as valid as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, texts that were found at Nag Hammadi that talk about Christ and things that Christ said and teachings of Christ. There was a Gospel of Thomas that they don't include in the Bible. They even mentioned that in that movie Stigmata, which interestingly enough didn't get nearly the amount of heat that we got when, when we were being attacked. And they clearly go after the church in that movie. There's a Gospel of Mary Magdalene. There's a lot of text that's not in the Bible. And we mentioned that in the movie. And it's like, not revolutionary notions. I didn't dig up this information myself. It's out there. What Kevin tried to do was to bring some of those accuracies into his project, talking about the ethnicity of Christ, talking about the fact that um, Jesus' parents had a normal, healthy relationship after he was born. And quite frankly, I think the Bible itself says that Jesus had brothers and sisters. Now, I know people twist that and they have all kinds of ideas about what it means, but I'm one that takes the scripture at, at every opportunity that I can, literally. I hesitate to think of Dogma as a, as a message film, because uh, message films to me tend to be pedantic and a little preachy and, and the one thing I wanted to make sure I wasn't doing in Dogma was being preachy or soapboxy because it's, it's a movie about religion and um, how kind of uh, ironic would that be if I was sitting there talking about oh some of the problems associated with organized religion and in the end wound up doing exactly what they did um, which is why I think Jay and Silent Bob are, are really crucial in, in that script probably more so than anything else we've done because they um, they kind of act as the pin that, that uh, pops the balloon if it gets too full of hot air. You know, if the movie becomes a little too full of itself or threatens to become too full of itself or its subject matter, they come along and, and make a dick or fart joke or, or a, an ass-fucking joke, which is always good to kind of take the, the head off of a religious yeah. issue. So you do anal? Is it true that chicks fart if you blast them in the ass? I didn't ask you out for sex. I'll take head. There was a draft of, of Dogma posted um, illegally, of course, on the internet. Um, we didn't put it up there. Lord knows no filmmaker ever wants their script to get out ahead of time. You kind of want the movie to be a surprise. Somebody else posted the script, unlike Drew's Scriptorama and, and News Askew, before it was a View Askew website. News Askew was run by two fans, two guys, uh, Brad and Chris, who really just liked our movies. And they were completely independent. They could put whatever they wanted on the site, and they put the script up there. We had no, nothing to do with that, because now News Askew is part of our website, part of the VOSQ website. Back then it wasn't. So it was posted there, and they kept saying, the Catholic League kept saying, it's a publicly available script, 
on Smith's website when it wasn't my website. I had nothing to do with it. Um, and publicly available, I mean, it doesn't necessarily make it legal. I, I understand it's kind of fishy when it comes to the internet, but it's not like I condoned it being out there. And when we were heading into production, we'd ask the lawyers to get into it and pull down all the dogma scripts off the net. And not even for the reason of I don't want the Catholic League getting a hold of it, but more because I just didn't want people reading the script before the movie came out. And if they had followed our advice or had been able to do it, none of this Catholic League stuff would have popped up because they wouldn't have had access to the script. Their specific function is to find things to go after. They don't find anything to go after, they don't get funded, because who's gonna fund the organization that just sits around and doesn't attack anything? So they, it's their job, is to sit around and watch television, read magazines, watch movies, and do those. They're, they're media watchdogs for the Catholic Church, uh, and they're funded by Catholics throughout America who send them money so they can basically do this. And, and if they don't have anything to go after, then they're out of business. I thought that, uh, I, I always felt like once they see the movie, they'll understand, you know, oh, that the ultimate message is, is um, of the flick, which I didn't want to include because I hate message movies, but the ult ultimately the movie is about something we can all agree on. Um, if, if you're a member of the faith, or if you're, if you're spiritual at all if you belong to any religion. Um, but what I didn't take into consideration was that um, in order to make that call, you have to see the movie first. And a lot of the people who kicked up a fuss about the movie had no interest in seeing it, weren't gonna see it, didn't see it ultimately. If you watch the movie, there's a, actually a really positive message. And the example that I use is, I brought my brother and his wife to the premiere in LA, and she's Catholic and she loved the movie. And her thing was, uh, if, if you are Catholic and would honestly let dogma shake your faith in your own religion, then it's not the movie, it's you. And I said, wow, that's a really good point. You make it sound like there's some church conspiracy to cover up the truth about Christ. Bullshit. Any important material about Christ would give people a better understanding of the nature of God. Why would they leave any of it out? Because it's all closely tied in with his family. His mother and father. His brothers and sisters. Jesus didn't have brothers and sisters. Mary was a virgin. Mary gave birth to Christ without having known a man's touch. This is true. But she did have a husband. And do you really think he would have stayed married to her for all those years if he wasn't getting laid? Saying that Mary and Joseph had sex was one of the things that always blew my mind that they attacked me for. Because if you read your Bible, in Mark, he talks about Jesus' brothers and sisters and lists Jesus' brothers by name. Um, doesn't list the sisters by name, but talks about his, his family unit. And now they'll tell you, well, brothers and sisters, he meant spiritually. And because they, they, they I, one, one interpretation I heard was they didn't have a word for cousin back then, so they called them brothers and sisters. Meanwhile, if you read a few chapters earlier when they're talking about Mary's cousin Elizabeth, it's like, well, it's not called Mary's sister Elizabeth. I mean, you know, it's kind of backwards logic like that. But the church has never really copped to, to Mary and Joseph having children beyond Christ. Most other religions do, and it's in the Bible. The Bible is kind of what we base our faith on. So I always thought it was weird that I got attacked for that, like that was some kind of unholy statement. I'm like, don't blame me, blame Mark, he wrote it. If, if we postulate that uh, Jesus' parents, um, mother and stepfather, Joseph, were natural, normal human beings in every other stretch of the imagination, how can we possibly, how can we possibly believe that they never slept together? So I believe it's in taking the time to deal with those issues that dogma is at its best. I didn't look at it as that controversial, but I'm not that religious, more of a spiritual. I believe in God and those things. Well, this is a movie with a rubber poop monster in it, you know, and, and angels with wings flying around, and, and it, it's just set in a fantasy realm. And yes, it talks about um, religious subject matter and talks about faith and church doctrine, but 
it's all handled very tongue in cheek, you know, and, and I think that's where a lot of people thought we tried to have our cake and eat it too by talking about heavy subject matter and mixing it in with a, a good dollop of, of just um, lowbrow humor as well. We're fucking fighting. Not more shit into existence. Sweet Christ, oh buddy, what's your bad? What is that thing? An excremental, the Golgothan. A what? A shit demon! No man of woman the fact of the matter is there were a lot of red herrings raised with this movie. First of all, the issue of whether God is portrayed as a woman. Uh, it overlooks the fact that in the beginning of the movie, God is portrayed as a man. It further overlooks the fact that one of the actors makes the clear statement. She's not really a woman. She's not really anything. Another issue, whether or not um, faith is torn down. I don't think so much faith is torn down. I think. Um, beliefs that people have based their life on that have no resemblance to what's actually in the Bible, those beliefs are, I think, torn down. Uh, one of the things about the 13th Apostle, um, first of all, I think the, the best thing that he ever says in the movie is, Jesus wasn't white, Jesus was black. Well, after all, um, the Middle East is not in the continent of Europe. It's in the continent of Africa. And the people that came from that area were people of color. I've met um, so-called Sephardic Jews, and they look like me. Uh, they don't look like a blonde, blue-eyed surfer boy. And so I think there was a lot of truth in the movie that if people got beyond the things that offended them, I didn't know that Alanis Morissette had a reputation for singing foul songs. Um, her music wasn't, uh, to me, the issue of her playing a role is whether or not she was an actress or whether she did a good job in the role. And quite frankly, I saw it and I thought she did a good job. So again, you, you take an issue and you make it something that it's not. You make, in essence, a red herring. And uh, that's what I think created most of the flack with the movie in the first place. Kevin didn't take $10 million, you know, from a studio and say, uh, I'm going to make a movie, a very um, cynical, you know, dark movie. Uh, because I hate Catholicism and I want other people to hate it too. So let's make a movie about it. That's seriously the way, you know, all this hype sort of, you know, made you think. You know, people were actually, I think, you know, thinking along those lines that it was that kind of movie, you know, but it's clearly not. <laughs> Bill Donahue presumes that the Catholic congregations of the world are, are pretty much made up of a bunch of idiots who are easily led and would be easily led away from their God by, by the likes of, you know, fucking Silent Bob. So I, I read a lot of things that Bill Donahue said about me in the press over the, the long haul before the movie came out and just kind of shook my head, didn't understand why. You know, I always, I knew the guy really wanted to debate me. You know, people kept saying he wants to debate you. I said, there's, there's really no point. Why, why give him any more press than he's getting? Because I really, when the movie was all said and done, when the movie came out, I expected to get a bunch of flowers from the Catholic League with a note that was like, thanks for a great 99. You know, thanks for putting us in the view of the public. Thanks for all the headlines. I never got that. But I did uh, speak to an Entertainment Weekly reporter um, when the movie was out, and he said he had spoken to Bill Donahue, and he said, Bill Donahue has a message for you. I said, what's that? He said, he wants to have a beer with you. And I said, what? And he said, yeah. He says he wants to sit down with you, have a beer. I said, I don't even drink. But he does, that Christian <laughs> drinks. But I was like, well, after all this time, like the dude wants to have a beer with me? That's the thing that really irritated me about him, too, was never he once wants you to make a sequel to the movie. Yeah, you know? he's just like, look, can you make Dogma 2? Because it's slow. <laughs> it's really the... slow this year, and we don't have anyone to attack. Um, but he, uh, he, he really went out of his way to talk to everyone else about the movie except me except us never called the office never logged in a call to the office going like hey i've heard some things about your movie let's talk 
this, this worries me, which is what you would do if you were a true Christian. I mean, I got a lot of email from priests before the movie came out saying, I'm concerned about the flick. Well-spoken, you know, not in your face. Some emails from priests afterwards going like, I don't understand what the fuss was all about. I thought it was a really good movie. Could have done without the bad language, but thought the message was very important. Um, but the guy never tried to contact me because there would be no press if he called me up and quietly said, hey, can, can we talk about this movie of yours? And, and again, it wasn't about faith, it wasn't about religion, it was about press. And, and the best way to get press was to start going after And that, that was the big fish. I mean, I was the little fish, I was the patsy, the target around chest by which to attack him that week. Um, once we were removed from the equation, really no little there, there's very little reason for him to, to go after the movie much further. The whole time I was like, if somebody could, if he could take that which he is and, and what he could do and feed Channel the hungry something or something worthwhile. else instead of being the guy who basically stops television shows. It's like, is that, you, it, it just doesn't make any sense to me. It's like you have all this, this finance and all these people and all this manpower to go out and like try to do good but his version of good is stopping a movie or stopping a television show it's just like it's so backward it's such a rich thing to do it's so like he's above everything else it's just like now he has to make sure that the entertainment industry is good for all the wealthy white people of america it's just like it's awful if the problem with it with him is and so many other people who get in your face about their beliefs is that these are the people who are on display speaking for the religion or for any particular religion. These are the people that are up front uh, crying foul, talking about how God's going to rain down fire and sulfur, tearing at the gay community, going after uh, the abortionists. These are the people who are firmly on display and these are the people that turn people off to religion. These are the people that you look at and go like, you know, if it was ever for me, if that's what it's about, I don't want to be involved. And that's kind of like what the movie was about. Get past that. Get past the people who put themselves in front of you and say, I am a man of God. Listen to me. Do wrong to this person. And by wrong, they don't consider it wrong because they think they're being pious by protecting the moral value. But judging anyone, if you're, if you're not God, is wrong. You know, do unto others as you have them do unto you. Judge not, lest ye be judged. Words of our Lord. I didn't make this up. Um, but he's, I, well, I told you I did, but, <laughs> you know, we'll talk. You know, I don't know how Mr. Donahue makes his living, and to me there are issues far more critical for us as Christians and Catholic Christians uh, to be um, concerned with. For example, the issue of whether or not um, a descendant of Christ happens to work in an abortion clinic. I think a lot of Catholics are torn over the abortion issue. I'm not. To me, abortion is murder, and that's the way I feel about it, and I'm vocal about that. But I'm certainly not going to um, stone somebody because they don't agree with me or that they feel differently. You know, no real legitimate, thoughtful, well-respected um, religious leaders or people, uh, you know, voiced any opposition or protest whatsoever to the movie. In fact, there was very little protest whatsoever. It's just that because it made for a good story and a good hook, you know, if there are three guys in front of the theater who are out there just in hopes of getting on camera, they got on camera. It became the self-fulfilling prophecy. And because, you know, guys like Bill Donahue, who's only noted for the, his, the only thing that anybody ever, the only reason anyone ever pays attention to Bill Donahue is because he likes to get himself in the press by, you know, taking staunch opposition to movies because he feels, you know, that they... I mean, the, the whole, by the very definition of the movie, they're private entertainment enterprises, under, with, un, you know, to which you're under no uh, obligation uh, or compunction to go see. As I listen to quotes that seem to me uh, to want to literally come out and attack the movie, uh, the producers, the actors, or whatever, I have to question what the real motivation is behind it. And exceptionally so when it comes from people who obviously haven't seen the movie. Um, one of the biggest sacred cows that Kevin attacks is the I mean, if you don't understand who the movie character, the movie character is in the movie, I mean, if that's not I'll eat my hat without salt. And to come in to say that this 
uh, movie character has become the, the, the golden calf of our generation is, I think, um, one of the finest bits of satire that's ever been written. Do you know what makes a human being decent? Fear. And therein lies the problem. None of you has anything left to fear anymore. You rest comfortably in seats of inscrutable power, hiding behind your false idol, far from judgment, lives shrouded in secrecy, even from one another, but not from God. That's not an attack on Christian doctrine. That's an attack on our materialistic society that we live in. How you can then say, well, we're going to stone this because of, of whatever our beliefs are, or we're going to come and attack this, I think uh, is very insincere. In all honesty, I thought I was doing the Lord's work. You know, I was just like, yeah, it's got some bad language in it, but, but it's spreading the word of God in its own bizarre fashion. And I thought uh, then, uh, that's an ultimate good. And how could anyone view that as a negative? But I was really naive, I guess. The success of the film comes from it being what it is, a good Kevin Smith film, right? But I think all the hype and controversy, quote unquote, helped sell movie tickets. People want to know, oh, I hear this new movie, it's, a, it's an outright bash, you know, on Catholicism. Oh, oh, I've heard this and I read this and this and this and that. Let's go see it. When we finished the movie, I was, what I was more afraid of, more so than the religious folks getting upset, were going to be the fans of, of the stuff we'd done previously, the people who really like Clerks and Mallrats and, and even Chasing Amy, because they'd feel like, God, what happened? You know, he used to be really funny, and now he just wants to talk about Jesus and church and it, what, it, where's the snoochie boochies type stuff. So I thought those would be the people, you know, who'd be really pissed off and the people we'd have to be afraid of. But the movie meant a lot to me, and I wanted to do it. You know, it's like if you if you're given the chance to kind of make movies and and um, and do whatever you, you want, tell whatever story you want within a reasonable budget, um, do something that's meaningful to you. And then the subject matter of dogma is really meaningful to me. Theology, for the most part, comes from seminaries where we teach what dead men used to believe two or three hundred years ago. And we teach it as if God put a personal imprimatur on it. And I have a problem with that. Now, I believe the Bible to be the Word of God. Don't get me wrong. But I believe that Jesus himself had such a great sense of humor that few people ever see ever capitalize and ever bring to the pulpit. And as a result, we lose the very kind of people that Jesus would have reached out to. And I thought, when I saw this project, Kevin was reaching out to those kind of people. This movie wasn't made for Christians. I'm a born again believer, and this movie wasn't made for me. But if it makes one person question his doubt, his unbelief, his lack of faith, if it makes one person question whether the doctrines or dogmas that he's been taught all his life are real and biblical, then I think it was a worthwhile project. You know, I'm enormously proud of the movie and, uh, and I had a really great time making it. For me as an actor, looking back on, on a career, kinds of movies I did, this movie will always stand out as one that was real different and sharp and distinct and uh, interesting, you know? And that's, uh, I think a lot of, you look at a lot of careers and they have like a lot of similar stuff. And that one of the things I really want to do is do different things and nothing could be more emblematic of that than this movie. And in the end, wow, you know? The, the bad people die and the good people prosper and have realizations and suddenly have faith again, you know, having been once jaded. So what's the fucking problem? What the fuck is this shit? Who the fuck are you, lady? Why the fuck did you hug my hand? Quite a little mouth on him, isn't there? What the fuck is this, the piano? Why ain't this broad talking? I believe the answers that you seek lie within my companion's eyes. What the fuck does that mean? Has everyone gone fucking nuts? What the fuck happened to that guy's head? I want some... About the whole experience itself and about the movie, I mean, it's been a long two years If you about in regards to physically working on the movie. It had been germinating since 93, really. 
So it had been a long, it's been a long seven years. Um, and having gone through it all and having received all the hate mail, having received death threats, you know, because we got death threats on the picture um, from, from people who, who really just didn't want the movie coming out based on what they've been told about the movie by organizations like the Catholic League and like the America Needs Fatima campaign and the, tra the tradition family property knuckleheads. Um, it, it was kind of scary for a little while, you know, and I, I got married in the process and had a child, you know, while we were working on the movie. And suddenly, I, it wasn't just me. I wasn't just fooling around with, with my own um, useless existence. I, I had a wife and a kid, and here I was getting death threats. So um, it, it, for, there were days where it was just like, my God, was this, any of this worth it? And then when the movie came out, and we started getting a lot of email on it, and email from people going like, I haven't thought about God in ages, and it, it made me want to go back to church, you know, which sounds hokey, but I got so many emails like that. Um, you, you expressed my ideas about religion so perfectly. Um, the movie was just funny as hell. You know, there are lots of email where people don't give a shit about what you were talking about in regards to religion. Religion, they were just happy to see some, some good jokes being told. You know, I think that the film we made was extremely difficult to make and and it was an uphill battle the whole way and so when it finally came out with all of these things against it um, I mean I think we succeeded on so many levels we won so many battles in the end and then ultimately we were a commercial success on a movie that's not really that commercial and I think that it you know, it's a great thing for us and everyone involved that we managed to get the story told the way we wanted to and get it out there and, and have people be very receptive to it. But um, on a personal level, the experience was um, extremely difficult. And I think the, the hardest thing, and it sounds kind of naive, but it just, for the first time, it really wasn't fun. For the vast majority of it, it was not fun. It was yeah. like, it was always, I mean, it was, it, every time you thought you were shutting a door, somebody kicked it back open and there was something new and, and awful to confront. And, you know, the hysteria of everybody else and, and, you know, I mean, death threats in itself is like the worst thing in the world to end anything like you spend two years working on anything and then somebody wants to kill you for it i mean that's that's pretty bad and we'd had a few death threats on mall rats but for yeah, completely but different was, reasons yeah, people go that movie sucks so hard i'm gonna kill you both but this time it was for religious beliefs which of which i have many and he has none so this yeah. dude's neck was on the line for shit where he's like look i'm not even, even sure believe god exists god. as two guys who started out making this low budget movie that was probably it'll never be that fun again because of the circumstances of making it the way we did yeah it wasn't it wasn't a walk in the park and it wasn't fun yeah. by any stretch of the imagination the other flicks you look back on and they were all really fun to make in their own weird ways each kind of unique um uniquely fun not the same across the boards chasing amy having made chasing amy right before it was such a great experience you know doing it kind of on our own away from the system and with friends and, and so much goodwill you know fostered toward that movie and then trying to make this movie where you're dealing with all these different schedules um, budgetarily, you're sitting there going like, I, I, do we have enough money to try to tell this story? Um, fighting to get a little more cash here and there, um, fighting to get the movie out, you know, in, in spite of or despite the, the best efforts of, of people like Bill Donahue. Um, dealing with the hate mail and the death threats and, and like going to Lincoln Center um, for, for for um, the New York Film Festival, which was a great honor, you know, and Cannes. We went to Cannes with the movie, and we should have been in Seventh Heaven. But in Cannes, the fear was like, should we, should we put up metal detectors in the doorways of the Palais just in case somebody comes in there and tries to shoot? It were very real fears. Uh, at Lincoln Center, seeing like almost a thousand people outside, depending on who you ask, some people say it's 400. Um, the tradition family property people will tell you it was 10,000 people outside protesting, but probably somewhere between 500,000 people protesting outside Lincoln Center. Um, and going inside and, and wanting to go out st on stage, like I was going on stage to introduce the movie and I had um, my daughter with me, my baby. And just before I went on stage, um, one of the publicists was like, I just want to remind you that anybody can buy a ticket to the screening. And I was like, sure, yeah, I get that. And she's like, no, 
anybody, even people that hate you, can buy a ticket to this public screening. And I'm like, oh my, I won't. I mean, tell me this now. I'm about to go out there with the kid, and, and you know, having to go out there with the kid, and then having to usher off stage real quick, just in case there was some nut bar in the audience who was just like, you know, for God and country, you know, not want to be a martyr to to anybody's cause that that kind of was conversed to everything that you wanted to do with the movie. So there there was just no fun to be had. You know, granted, while we were shooting, there were some good times. We got to hang out with some friends. We got to meet some new people. Um, it, it was great to work with Carlin and, and Rock and Alan Rickman and, and, um, and Salma and, and, of course, Ben and Matt again and, and Muse, as always, and Jason Lee. Uh, fun stuff there from time to time, but largely it was, it was a lot of headache and, and a lot of heartache and, and a lot of trepidation and fear and just worry that this was all going to turn out okay. Uh, and, and, and it, it did at the end of the day. And we got to you know, do a little business and keep our lives, which I think is the key goal in any yeah, movie making experience. Succeed and Make live. a little business and, and live. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I'd agree. It wasn't nearly as fun as the others, and hopefully it'll never be like that again. I mean, maybe the key is just never make religious pictures. You know, pretty much to stay away from that topic. I think I've, I've pretty much said everything I want to say about religion for now. It'll be years you before. Have. Yeah. You have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I really have. Hey, you guys want to hear something sick? I got half a stock when she kissed me. Jay! I couldn't help it. The bitch was hot. You know, you can't talk to me that way anymore. I'm gonna be somebody's mother. You're pregnant? You're pregnant when we're gonna have sex with your third trimester. I'll keep that in mind.